Welcome to the journey home. My name is Marcus Brodi, and I extend a greeting to you who are listening to us around the world on television and radio. It's a great privilege to uh, talk to you each week about uh, journeys of faith, men and women who love Jesus Christ and are willing to follow him wherever he leads. And uh, particularly we talk on the journey home about their being drawn to the Catholic faith. My guest this evening is Marty Barrett. He's the author of several books, How We Communicate, but uh, most recently a book called Second Exodus. And the theme that we chose for tonight's program is Rabbi Jesus, Messiah. Now you might think that's not a controversial subject for our usual mm-hmm. discussion here on The Journey Home. But Marty is a, is a <coughs> journey from the Jewish faith into the Catholic Church. And so the issue of Rabbi Jesus, the Messiah, was a very significant issue in his spiritual journey. So thank you for joining us. Remember, your questions are a very important part of our program. So if you give us a call at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Marty, welcome to the Journey Home. Pleased to be here with you. It's good to have you here. I first became aware of you through your book, Second Exodus. And mm-hmm. You've got to make sure that uh, at some point during the program, the cover of the book is displayed. Uh, it's a wonderful book. So it's not really your journey of faith, but it talks about the issues of your journey uh-huh. and your work that you do. Not. Right. It's not my journey, Second Exodus, but it's about the, your journey. It's about the journey of every person <coughs> that would like to travel from Judaism to the Catholic faith. All right. Great. And I will say that if you've got some, uh, some good um, endorsements here on the book. Uh, mm-hmm. Father John Harden, uh, Reverend William Most. Uh, mm-hmm. David Moss, who's yep. been on my program with his sister yep. Rodwin, the audience uh-huh. is amazing. And Mark Drogan has been on the program. Yes, mm-hmm. so that's all good endorsement. Okay. They help, yeah. don't they, when you're doing mm-hmm. to Absolutely. Do the book? They should do. I'm going to start like we do every week, and I'm going to mm-hmm. invite you to give us a video of spiritual facts. Okay. I grew up Jewish, as you know. <coughs> uh, it was an all Jewish neighborhood, Marcus. <coughs> so Jewish, there were four synagogues within walking distance. <laughs> Four synagogues within walking distance. And in fact, I'm wondering how that works. The Protestantism would say that there's a bit of a competition. Was there a competition between synagogues? Uh, to some extent. How does that work? I'm okay. Sorry. Mostly, <coughs> what you have, see, it depends, it depends on, the, on the rabbis. You have an Orthodox synagogue, conservative, or reformed. Oh, the Orthodox, the Orthodox <coughs> hold very close to the Torah. The 613 commandments that were given 3,000 years ago, <coughs> and they still hold to as, as close to that as it possibly can. <coughs> now, the conservative Jews relax that somewhat, and they say, well, yes, <coughs> we certainly want to be holding to these commandments, but on the other hand, there are some practical things that we want to do <coughs> in, today's, in today's time, <coughs> and some of these things don't quite make the sense that they used to. <coughs> uh, <coughs> for example, we might talk about riding on the Sabbath. <coughs> An Orthodox Jew will not ride on the Sabbath because once upon a time, it was work. We went and you had to saddle the horse, you know, and all that. <coughs> so the rabbinical law said, you don't ride on the Sabbath? That's it. For a conservative Jew, you might say, oh, well, look, <coughs> you know, it's not the work it was. Some conservative Jews will still say, yes, it is, because you're lighting a fire. It's another one of the things that, because it was work, it was prohibited by the rabbinical law. So <coughs> there are gradations even within those. But the Orthodox holds strictly <coughs> to the Torah. The conservatives, and somewhat relaxed it, although they're still pretty much hold to the traditions. The Reformed Jews <coughs> tend to be very much more relaxed, <coughs> um, pretty much more modern. Mm-hmm. They pretty much say, well, the Torah was for 3,000 years ago. We still try to hold to it in some ways, but basically we're adapting the Torah to life as we think it would be today. You would say, I mean, this might be an obvious question, but you would say all three of those groups would have a belief in God, as opposed to what might say the cultural Judaism of some that we will encounter who are Jews but sadly are atheists. <coughs> yes. <coughs> yeah. the, you want, uh, the belief in God of all three branches <coughs> is certain. You will find some, some Jews in the Reform branch who do not believe in God. <coughs> they, and they are cultural Jews. Ju- Judaism is both <coughs> a religion but it's also a nation of people. <coughs> and that tends to all flow together, <coughs> and it, it's hard to separate them. But so you have different kinds of synagogues, okay. and then on the Saturday, which one did you run to? 
I went to the conservative synagogue. I was trained, I was trained in, in, to be, be very much with the traditions, but, uh, but to make some accommodation with them. So you were the, the, the middle? The middle of the, the, middle, middle of the road. Uh, did you have an active you know, faith life then as a young man? And before I was 13, I did. <clears throat> because every Jew before he's 13 years old is bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the bar mitzvah is the coming of age. What it says, <clears throat> the word bar, son, mitzvah, commandment. Son of the commandment. <clears throat> when you're a bar mitzvah, you become a son of the commandment, which means you now participate in Jewish life in full. <clears throat> And so there's a period of training for that that encompasses in several years. And during that training, I was pretty religious. After the training, of course, then it relaxed me somewhat. And the problem I had was that I had a conflict. Because on the one hand, Judaism said, well, I, I couldn't go out and date for all nights and things. Do these girls. <laughs> and if I follow Judaism, Half my dating time would be cut off. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I'm going to chase the girls. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Not the right thing to do, but that's what I did. It sounds like that particular motive doesn't exist only in Judaism, but we find that after Confirmation and Catholicism and, and uh, mainline Protestantism, mm -hmm. where sadly we, these, these rites which were to confirm our faith give us the impression that we've arrived. Amen. And now we can sit back and coast. Yes, is that what happened to you? It's what happened to me. Of course, now we know exactly the opposite is true. It's a lifelong journey. Yeah. But at the time, you know, with a child's understanding, that's where I went. Okay. How long did you remain in the Jewish faith? <coughs> really until I mean, uh, until my uh, mid forties. Okay. So you were Jew for about forty plus years. Yes. Was it an active part of the mm -hmm. whole life there, or had it become this coasting and I tell you, that I self? I tell you what, it was an active part <coughs> in the cultural sense and in the moral sense. I always considered myself very much morally a Jew, uh, but a non-practicing Jew, and I did not go to synagogue. I didn't, um, I didn't focus on Jewish ritual. Uh, I simply tried to focus on being a, uh, a Jew in the moral sense. And an example is this book, How We Communicate, the Most Vital Skill. <coughs> I had originally uh, written, I had always been I've always loved the idea of how ideas get from one mind to another. I was always fascinated by this. How do ideas get from one mind to another? How do people communicate with one another? There are so many, many ways. And I never could explain it to anybody because it wasn't time. I had a whole comprehensive idea in my head, and it wasn't time to explain it. And the only way to do this is to write a book. Why did I write the book? At the time, I didn't really know. I knew, just knew it was something I felt I ought to do. And so <clears throat> I wrote this book, How We Communicate the Most Vital Skill. And that grew out of my Jewishness in the sense of wanting to do something moral for people at large. It's the influence in a positive sense. If you look back on your days of Judaism, uh, where did the, the title of our program fit in? Did, did Rabbi, Jesus, and Messiah have any connection with you, those three words? And how did they connect? Okay. At the, time, at the time, they did not. <clears throat> The, uh, my idea of Jesus was good rabbi, uh, but there was not a lot of relate. There was not a lot of relevance. Mm -hmm. A Jew basically goes about his business um, working out of the Old Testament, and once we reach the end of the Old Testament, basically <coughs> salvation history. I don't want to say salvation history stops because obviously it continues, but <coughs> the, the commandments of God stop at that point. And after that, is the pause button on? Is that kind of way to look at it in a way? Oh, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What what you uh, what you find is there's the Old Testament, and then there are commentaries on it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But there's in these different groups that you mentioned, and there's more. I mean, there's the city Jews. I'm holding sure. there, but all have a different uh, perspective on whether they're still waiting for a Messiah and how active of a wait that is. Well, they're, all, they're all waiting for the Messiah. Always with myself. This is a constant throughout Judaism. <coughs> In fact, at the end of the Passover Seder, <coughs> uh, there's always a uh, an, an empty during the Passover Seder. There's always an empty chair, an empty place setting for Elijah. <coughs> and um, at the end of the evening, the uh, the head of the household sends the youngest son out 
and he, and he says, go out and see if Elijah is there. And the youngest son looks out, out the door and he comes back, he says, Father, Elijah has not yet come. And then the, the head of the household consoles himself. He says, well, he says, uh, the Messiah will not, you know, has not yet come next year in Jerusalem. Uh, next year in Jerusalem. Uh -huh. Was that a, a, a custom then in all three of those branches of, of the Jewish church? All three would have done that? Yes. Okay. As far as I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you just cross my mind that it mm -hmm. seemed like the more uh, reformed tradition may have kind of uh, you know, de-emphasized that. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, let, let's remember that <coughs> Jews always are doing things in different ways. Uh, you have Jews in, in most every country in the world, I guess. and the different persuasions. Each Jew tends to follow his own rabbi. You know, in the Catholic Church, we have the Pope. And to put it in a very simple way, if you want to find out what the Catholic faith teaches, you ask the Pope. In the manner of speaking. <coughs> but for Jews, you ask your local rabbi. And the local rabbi follows a rabbinic tradition. Maybe it's a, you know, a very esteemed rabbi. Or maybe it's a, a school of thought. Uh, but this particular rabbi follows a school of thought, and you follow that rabbi. If you're uncomfortable with that, enough with that school of thought, you're going to look for another synagogue. So <coughs> it's oh, always done. Familiar. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and so it's always done a little bit differently everywhere. And yes, that's a familiar thing to us. Yeah, that's right. Well, then what uh, what got this Jewish boy interested in the Catholic Church? Oh, I <coughs> I tell you, I have to take you back, Marcus, just a little bit <clears throat> before the experience itself. God is so interesting. He prepares us. When, <clears throat> now, mind you, remember, I grew up in an all-Jewish neighborhood. The school I went to had 2,000 Jews and six Catholics. <laughs> and nothing else. <clears throat> so in a Bible game, the Catholics are a bit overpowered, <clears throat> I'd say. <clears throat> I think so. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think so. <clears throat> so, he was all-Jewish. <clears throat> There was one Catholic family moved into the neighborhood, and he became my best friend. The kid, the ten year old kid became my best, my best friend. And I went to his house, and I see all these <coughs> holy pictures. Holy, the pictures, the holy pictures all over the house. And I thought, these people really care about the Catholic faith. Didn't understand it, didn't know much about it, but I knew that there was something very important about it because these people cared so very much. And I went to church, come rain or come shine. One time I went there, it was going to be the band. They went to church. I said, can't be able to get the car out. He said, we're going. God will get us. Jesus will get us there. You know, can practice. <clears throat> uh, some years later, I was a home radio operator by then. It's been a hobby of mine for many, many years. And I made contact with a fellow uh, who introduced himself as Brother George at Greenwood Garrison, New York. And I said, hi, George, it's nice to meet you. So, you know, it's, it's all very well that we're friends, you know, we're all friends here on the home band, but isn't brother getting a little bit uh, familiar? And he broke out laughing. It took him a couple minutes to get control of himself. And finally, he says, I'm Franciscan friar. He says, we're Catholic monastic order. He says, haven't you ever heard of us? He said, no. I'm Jewish. I come to live in a Jewish neighborhood. I don't know from Catholics. And so he said, well, would you like to come visit? I went up there to visit. And one of the places he took me was up on top at the time. Now, I hadn't been there in 40 years. This is, this is what it was 40 years ago. But when we went up on the top, there was a Holy Ghost Chapel. And there was an antenna, ham radio antenna, all the way out on the end of it. And I looked, I said, how in the world did they get that up there? The ground fell away, so you couldn't put a ladder there. You'd have to crawl out on this very steep ladder. And I asked this priest there, and I said, said how did you do this? He said, I crawled out there and I did that. He said, he could have been killed. He said, yeah. And he said, the Lord explains this. I went to confession and I received Holy Communion before I went out there. He said, my purpose in doing it was to spread the Catholic faith all through this valley. He said, if I died in that effort, after, receiving, after going to confession and receiving Holy Communion, my soul would have flown straight to heaven. He said, and that would, that's the purpose of my life. Very impressive. He hear that this man was willing to commit his life, absolutely willing to give up his life for Christ. And I saw it. How old were you then? Oh, uh, well, this was about 18. Okay. Uh, that made it possible to marry my beautiful wife, Audrey. Uh, she was Catholic. 
I was Jewish, <coughs> and we, I, I was comfortable marrying a Catholic because I knew that there was something really important about the Catholic faith. Right? It wasn't she was just some kind of pagan. <coughs> she was Catholic, and, and there was something strong, something real there. Even though I didn't recognize it. So we married, and for 20 years we went along. And then <coughs> one day, I mean, had, he was going to, to mass, and you were going to synagogue. Right. Right. I was going. She was going to mass. I was not going to synagogue. But basically, was you do what you like, I'll do what I like. Right. We were both comfortable. God has blessed us in many ways, but never with children. Mm -hmm. And so it was simply, <coughs> you do what you want, I'll do what I want. We'll both help and support each other. But basically, you do your thing, I'll do mine. For 20 years, we went along like that. Now she had a job traveling overseas a great deal. She was an, an international negotiator, and so. When she would go overseas, we were living at that time in Burke, Virginia. And I used to like to walk from the house to a shopping center nearby. Beautiful walk. And it took me right past the Catholic Church. It was only a quarter of a mile away. Of course, that was Irene's parish church. But it didn't mean anything to me. I just paid no attention to it. And I would take this walk every so often, especially when she was away. One time I took the walk. And you know, whenever I walk, I'm always thinking about something. I'm always planning something playing back a conversation, thinking how I could have done it better. Always something going on. Uh, this time, I suddenly felt a hush come over me. I couldn't think about anything. Very peaceful, very pleasant. But a hush. And I felt <clears throat> an inter what I now would call an interior location. Uh, which is, I felt God speaking to me interiorly, saying, I love you. I have always loved you. Come home. I love you. And I, knew, I knew it was coming from the Catholic Church. What do you mean? I mean, this, this is not my religion. It's not, this isn't relevant to me. <clears throat> I kept walking. The closer I got to the Catholic Church, the stronger it was. After I walked past it, it began to get weaker. By the time I got to the shopping center, it was gone. Okay. <clears throat> Ooh, what was that? Maybe a conversation I had a long time ago. Maybe there's something I ate. Couldn't remember a thing. <clears throat> Took the same walk the second time, same thing, both ways. And again, I dismissed it. That had been some conversation I had with somebody long time. That been a book I read. Finally, third time, same thing, both ways. Finally, <coughs> could I be being called? Could this be a call from God somehow? No. Uh, so, uh, as it happened, I held eight years to take the shroud of Cyril. Um, that uh, when I was watching, I got to Larry and we were watching it, and I was fascinated with it. It's a fairly decent scientific background, so I figured I'll, I'll study this a little bit and learn more about it so I can explain to Irene at least it's a relic. It'll be important to her. Well, it was important. The, the evidence proved, at least to me, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the shroud of Serena was authentic. But then I suddenly noticed something that caught my attention. You see, the, the, image, the shroud image was formed by radiation from a body. And that much is scientifically pretty well established. <coughs> but also, <coughs> the image appears on the one side of the shroud. Now that means it must have happened very, very fast. To the people, this is just a linen cloth. Mm he -hmm. travels through a linen cloth very quickly. If you try to take a linen cloth and grab a hot pot, um, you'll burn yourself, because mm -hmm. the heat will travel right through it. <coughs> but this was scorched on only one side. That means it must have been very, very rapid. Perhaps another second. I said, wait a minute. Put these together. Human beings don't go off like flash bulbs. The only possibility <coughs> was <coughs> the resurrection. Wait a minute. If the resurrection is true, then Jesus is God. If Jesus is God, I have to <coughs> completely think about who I am and where I'm going. And I've tried. <coughs> there's, there's a great deal that, that's happened in between. But I'll fast forward it uh, to the point where <coughs> I, was, I had taken a class. And at the end of the class, they said, would you like to be, who, who would like to be baptized? And everybody looked at me, and I said no. <coughs> because, you see, I was worried by that time as to whether I was doing it for Ari or I was doing it for God. As much as I love Ari with all my heart, this is between me and God. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, <coughs> I'll do a Rabbi Gamaliel. I'll set this aside for a year. Remember what Rabbi Gamaliel said? <coughs> Tell the audience. Please. Okay. 
uh, Rabbi Gamaliel, uh, shortly after the ascension, uh, the, uh, the twelve apostles were all in one place and they were captured. And Sanhedrin was going to try to execute them. Um, could snuff out Christianity right then and there. Uh, but Rabbi Gamaliel said, wait. Uh, they distinguished, old distinguished rabbi, and he said, <coughs> if this is of men, it's going to fizzle out anyway. But if this is of God, uh, you won't be able to stop it, and you might even find yourself fighting against God. I counsel, let these men go. And <coughs> although he would have loved to kill them, <coughs> Rabbi Gamaliel had such prestige and such weight within the Sanhedrin that they let the apostles go. <coughs> and so, this is what I decided to do. Let it wait. If it goes away, it's of man. If it stays with me, it's of God. <coughs> I waited. A year later, <coughs> it was now, again, it's the same time next year, just a few weeks before Easter Vigil. And I, and I suddenly realized that I was stuck. I said, okay, first of all, this is still very much with me. <coughs> so, something of God in this. But I couldn't go forward and I couldn't go back. I couldn't go forward because I loved the Father, Father God with all my heart and soul. And I said, I belong to Father God, body and soul, and I'm not budging. Father God is God, and I'm with him forever. The Catholics worship Jesus. Now what am I going to do? And yet, I couldn't go forward, and yet I couldn't go back either. I thought I had come too far. And I had some sense that I was being called. What am I going to do? Only one thing to do. I prayed and I said, Father God, show me your will. For 46 years now I've been a Jew for you. I've tried to be that. Now you seem to be calling me into the Catholic Church. But Father, Catholics worship Jesus and I belong to you. Please, Father God, if you give me to Jesus, then I'll happily serve Jesus, knowing that by serving him I am serving you. If you don't, I'll go right back to being Jewish and I'll forget the whole thing. Please, Father God, show me your will. And please, 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 let it be so clear that I will not be wrecked by doubt. Because I was so fearful of a subtle signal that I might mis mis misunderstand, and then I would be always fearful of disobedience no matter what I did. And so, <clears throat> please, let it be so clear that I will not be wrecked by doubt. What is the instant I lowered my eyes from heaven, <clears throat> I saw a vision of Jesus Christ walking beside me. He was dressed in a humble shepherd's robe, but... <clears throat> What, what I described at that time as clothed in light. Now I would say transfigured. Clothing, outer, outer clothing of light, radiating light. Oh my God. And just as I was about to say something, mentally at least, I felt that same hush again. And I said, and I couldn't think. I kept trying to think, to say something. I couldn't think. I couldn't. It was just a hush. And I felt, <clears throat> you know what he said before? I love you. I've always loved you. Come home. Now, same thing, same everything except, I love you. I've always loved you. Welcome home. <clears throat> and then I thought, <clears throat> at that point, the, the, the quiet lifted somewhat. <clears throat> and I started to say, this is Jesus Christ. This is God walking beside me. I gotta say something. I gotta be friendly. <coughs> what do you say when you're walking beside God? No. Oh. Hi, God. Nice to see you. Oh, come on, I can't say that. <coughs> God, it's, it's so much more than nice to see you. I said, Jesus. I got you. Know, I <coughs> and I felt Jesus saying to me, Relax. It's all right. You don't have to say anything. I know. I know you so much better than you know yourself. Relax. It's all right. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, Lord. I really, but I gotta be friendly with that. <coughs> nice day, Lord. How can I say nice day, Lord? To the, to the, the God who created all of the days of the universe. <coughs> Relax. That's all right. You don't have to say anything. I love you. I know. I know. <coughs> I understand. And he couldn't get me to quiet down. I just kept, I gotta be friendly with <coughs> So finally, he turned to me and he smiled and said, Clear enough? Spoke with tension, I just laughed and I said, Clear enough, Lord Jesus. Disappeared. I went home as fast as I could. I mean, had just gotten back from the trip that day, so she was home. I got her home. I walked in and I said to her, Honey, call up your priest. I want to be baptized now. <laughs> hmm? What happened? I called her. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we went in. <clears throat> so she called up the priest. 
This was three priests serving 7,000 people. You couldn't get an, an appointment within two weeks. The Holy Spirit was there. She got in with the pastor for that very evening. She said, see the pastor? What can I do for you, my son? Well, Father, I'd like to be baptized. Oh, he says, that's nice. He says, what, uh, what brought you to this? I told him. And he said, you're ready. He says, boy, are you ready. <laughs> he says, when would you like to be baptized? And I know what I intended to say, Marcus, the Holy Spirit was there. <clears throat> what I intended to say was, well, let's see, you're a Catholic priest. I mean, you know, this is a church. There must be a baptismal font someplace, um, some holy water. Uh, can we do it tonight? How long does it take? That's what I intended to say. What I heard myself saying was, well, Father, <clears throat> You know so much about this faith, and I know so little. When I come to know much more about the faith, what will seem to be the, the most significant time? Easter Vigil. I said, why Easter Vigil, Father? Because just as Christ died for our sins and rose in you in glory, so you will die in your sins and rise in you in Christ. And I said, yes, yes, yes. Okay, write my name down, Father, for Easter Vigil. I want to see my name on the calendar. And he said, oh, he says, we don't forget things like this, believe me. And I said, Father, I'm not budging off this chair until I see you write my name on the calendar. Said, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, B-A-R-R-A-C-K. See, see, okay, okay, yes, I see. You know, and he gave the paperwork, you know, to fill out. <clears throat> I went home, I kept praying, because I didn't understand that about baptism by design. Please, Lord, please let me live until I'm baptized. <clears throat> and I received on that Easter Vigil, 1989, the sacramental triple header. Baptism, confirmation, holy Eucharist. That's not the end of the story. <clears throat> Two weeks after that, I was sitting in, remember I'd written how we communicate the most vital skill earlier. I didn't really know why I'd ever written it. This is something I felt I needed to do. A good thing to do. <clears throat> I was sitting down, the book had just been published very, very recently, and it's sitting on a copy. Every, every, every author's first, first book sitting on the coffee table, you know. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, notice that. Yeah, that's my book. Yes, it is. <clears throat> and so, I was sitting on the coffee table, and I sat down to pray, and I said, you know, Lord, you went to a lot of trouble to bring me into the Catholic Church. And Lord, I know you didn't go to this much trouble to bring me in here just to pump me down in the middle of the Catholic Church and walk away. So, Lord, there's got to be a mission. And you know what? I'd like to get on with it. So tell me, Lord, what's the mission? What would you like me to do for you? He caused me to look at that book. And I looked down at that book, how we communicate the most vital skill. And I distinctly heard him say, communicate my word as far and wide as you can. I said, yes, Lord, I'll do that for you. I'd love to do that for you. Um, I said, Wait a minute. What am I saying? <coughs> Lord, <coughs> I've only been a Catholic about three weeks. But how can I communicate your word? He caused me to look down at the book again. When I looked down at the book, I distinctly heard him say, of course you can. You wrote the book on communication. <laughs> he got me. I did. <coughs> it is. Okay. Okay, Lord. Yeah. Well, then, Lord. <clears throat> you know, I thank you. You gave me some communication skills. But, Lord, what am I supposed to, you know, I've only been a Catholic a few weeks. How am I going to know what to say? And he said, Moses had the same concern. <clears throat> and, of course, I remembered, you know, Moses saying, send some other man. I said, okay, Lord, you and me, we're going to do this together. Okay. And that's how I became Catholic. And that led to your, uh, we'll tell the audience that on your uh -huh. website, which is what, second exodus, second, second exodus com. Uh, I wanted to mention that because if the audience wants to know a little more in detail, some of, like, there's a lot of years in there you jumped over in terms yes. of struggling through the issues of the doctrine, sure. the issues of the faith, and then that also read, led to your uh, writing mm -hmm. second exodus. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to take a break and come back. When we come back, why don't you get, tell a little bit of how, now as a Catholic, talk briefly about Rabbi Jesus the Messiah, and particularly how that led you to write this book, Second Exodus. Amen. We'll be back in just a bit. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back. Welcome back. My guest this evening is Marty Barrick. He has shared with us his journey of faith. Uh, been brought, uh, brought up Jewish, into the Catholic faith. And we ended uh, talking about his book, Second Exodus. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted us to jump into our theme, but I'm thinking our first email might open the door for you to talk about the theme of Rabbi Jesus and Messiah. So let me go with our first email. This comes from Lee. Emmanuel means God with us. Mm -hmm. Do Jews expect the coming Messiah to be the Son of God in the literal sense? In other words, do Jews expect the coming Messiah to have a divine nature, or do they expect the Messiah to be an anointed man like Moses or David? <coughs> Marcus, the answer to that question is <coughs> different Jews, two Jews, three opinions. <coughs> there are some Jews that do expect a divine person. <coughs> Other Jews expect an anointed person. Um, I wish I could give you more of an answer than that, but there are different Jews, different perspectives on it. But what, the, what this brings us into is um, uh, the idea of the Messiah, at least the way I understand him. And, you know, Jesus was a Jew. The Catholic teaching is he was the most Jewish Jew that ever lived, in the sense that he is the only Jew, and you find it in the Catechism, I think it's 578, um, the Catechism says Jesus is the only Jew who ever was able to keep all of the commandments. This is Catholic teaching. So Jesus was the most Jewish Jew of all. He had an entourage of 12 Jews who represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And what this all comes down to is he sum Jesus summarized all of Judaism. When I see Jesus, I see all of Judaism speaking at once. For example, let me just give a small, a small illustration. Time flies so fast. Okay. We take the Ten Commandments. The first three cover how do we how we love God. The remaining seven love how we love one another. Okay. So Jesus' two great commandments summarize the Ten Commandments that the Old Testament gives us. And there's a great deal more to be folded into this. Uh, second Exodus actually contains a great deal more about it. But the bottom line is that Jesus is the fulfillment and completion of the Old Testament. It's a continuous stream of salvation history where our loving Father is teaching his children. And at first he teaches them with very simple lessons. For example, the covenant with Noah in Genesis 9. A few simple instructions. And with Abraham it gets a little bit more. We get to circumcision. Now there has to be a sign, which reminds us, by the way, of baptism because circumcision is a sign that's invisible and yet it's also indelible. You can't reverse it. And the same thing with baptism. It makes an, an indelible sign from the soul. Uh, then we get to the 613 commandments of the whole Torah. <coughs> then, and with all the sacrifice, then King David starts in with the theme of what God desires and Isaiah picks it up. And it's not so much sacrifice as a broken heart. A broken, humble heart, O oh Lord, you will not scorn. And finally, that leads us to Jesus, who is the final sacrifice and is the, the completion and summary of all that had gone before. So it's the continuous upbringing of God's covenant children, bringing us finally to the final lesson, Jesus, which is elaborated and played out until the end of time. So when we understand ourselves as being adopted into the family of God, that's what we're being adopted into. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The stream, the family, it goes all the way back to Abel, you know, all the way mm -hmm. back to the beginning of yes. all, all of God's people. Yes, it is. Continuous stream. In every place you love, good, just begin at Pentecost. I mean, that's the, the danger that many kind of see themselves to be forget mm -hmm. that whole Old Testament. Well, <coughs> you know, <coughs> Marcus, it's like, it's like taking somebody who has a doctorate degree and say, this is a very advanced degree. But if you somehow had a way of sucking out of his brain everything from his bachelor's degree back, <coughs> So he knew nothing of all that, and he only had what he learned his master's and doctorate degrees, he'd be almost non-functional. He wouldn't know how to read and write. He wouldn't, he wouldn't know all of the basic lessons that he's learned up until that point. He might know the advanced chemistry, but he'd be crippled. And was very good at that mm -hmm. proof text thing and pulling things out of the mm -hmm. context. Sure. Let's take our first caller, this is mm -hmm. uh, Dianita from Texas. What's your question for us tonight? Good evening, Mr. Brock, and welcome to the Body of Christ. 
Mm -hmm. My question Thank to you is the following. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had a struggle, and if you did, if you could describe that struggle, with the second commandment, as far as idolatry is concerned, once you enter into the Catholic Church as a Jewish man. What was that like for you? Thank you, Diane. Okay, and, yeah, and thank you very much. It is an interesting question. <coughs> Uh, no, I never had a problem with idolatry, and let me explain why. <coughs> the images in the Catholic Church <coughs> are, are not worshipped per se. They're in the same category as the pictures that many men carry of their wives and women carry of their husbands. <coughs> when I have a picture of my wife in my wallet and I take it out and look at it, I don't think that that, that picture, that little piece of paper and, and chemicals, is my wife. <coughs> but it makes me think of my wife, it helps me think of my wife <coughs> when she's not there. In the same way, when I look at a crucifix, when I look at an image of Mary, I'm not praying to the image. I'm praying to the Jesus or the Mary that's in my heart. <coughs> and uh, the image only helps me concentrate. It only helps me think about it because Jesus is invisible. I can't see Jesus, at least not today. And so if I look at a crucifix, I say, yes, yes, it helps me to focus my mind. So no idolatry at all. Yeah, that's right. Um, and we might go on to that a little bit later if we get more questions on it. But yeah. I know in one of your books, one of your stories, you address that issue also about that um, with the incarnation of Christ, mm -hmm. we see this visualization of God mm -hmm. through the incarnation. Yes. <coughs> you know, when we go back to Exodus 23, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, and it says, uh, you know, you shall not make images. But if you look, I think it's 20, 20, 20 verse 3, <clears throat> if you look at the, the verse immediately before that and the verse immediately after that, it says, for worship. <clears throat> so God is forbidding us to make images for worship. And if we look ahead just a little bit, we find Moses being commanded to make an image of a bronze serpent. And if you notice, <clears throat> King, that, that bronze serpent remains because it's not worship. But when the Jews finally started worshiping it under King Hezekiah, then God was commanded, commanded to be destroyed. Oh, yeah. Of course, you have the angels on the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. So there you have graven images. But right. the worst of those, uh, exactly. Okay. Let's take our next email. This comes from Chris. Marcus, my question is for your guests. Why not become a Messianic Jew? What are the roots of the Messianic Jews? And do they separate themselves from the earliest Christians, from the apostles, and the Catholic Church? Some of the viewers may not know what a Messianic Jew is. Okay, good point. <coughs> A Messianic Jew is a Jew who has come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but has separated himself from the tradition through which it was brought to us. You see, for 2,000 years, uh, the Catholic Church that has presented Jesus to us, that Jesus instituted, and has been carrying forward all of this time. Now, you cannot just lop off 1,500 years and say, okay, we're going to start right here in 1517 and go forward from there. The Holy Spirit was doing something. Jesus was doing something during all that time. We, let's take a look at two gospel, uh, two gospel passages. Uh, let's take a look, first of all, at uh, the Gospel of John, the very last verses. It says, And Jesus did many other things uh, that are not written down, but that uh, if they were all to be written down, the whole world couldn't contain the books to be written. Okay, fair enough. Maybe we're not talking about the whole world couldn't contain, but certainly Jesus did many, many, many other things that were not written down in the Gospels. And St. John, we have St. John's personal authority for that. We go to the end of Matthew's Gospel, and Jesus says, Go out into the whole world, <coughs> teaching them all that I've commanded you. All that I've commanded you. Not what <coughs> are going to be written down in the four Gospels, but <coughs> all that I've commanded you. And there's a very large difference between the two on St. John's authority. <coughs> That's sacred tradition. <coughs> now, a Jew should be very comfortable with sacred tradition because, you see, Moses gave the Jews, or God, God gave the Jews through Moses, both the written Torah and also the oral Torah. And if you remember, the oral Torah <coughs> was carried down from generation to generation, was not to be written down until the rabbis decreed that Judaism was in such a, such a state of flux that the oral Torah might be lost. Only then could it be written down. <coughs> the rabbis decreed that this was so about 200 AD, and so they wrote it down as the Talmud. So for Jews, there is an oral tradition. 
-hmm. And it's as important as the written tradition. And any Jew today will tell you, should tell you, that the Talmud is as important to them as the Torah, or at least um, in the same general range. Um, um, the same thing is true in the Catholic faith. Um, we have the sacred tradition, which is described to us you know, by comparing St. John and St. Matthew, um, and that also comes down to us as a tradition that was oral for a great deal of time, a couple of centuries, and then it was written down by the Church Fathers. And so we have the sacred tradition and also by the Popes. And so, in order to get the full Jesus, the full range of Jesus, the complete deposit of faith that Jesus Christ left us, the only place to find it is Catholic Church. Trust that, that Jesus' promise was fulfilled in his apostles when he promised that he'd send the Holy Spirit to guide them into truth. We believe that yeah. from the very beginning. It didn't take a 1,500 year hiatus. Okay. Let's take our next caller, mm -hmm. Dan from Minnesota. What's your question for us? Thank you. Um, you touched on this earlier, Martin, about the Christian belief that the sacrifices and sin offerings of the Old Testament foreshadowed the perfect sacrifice of Christ. And I was wondering how present day Jews uh, make atonement for their sin without a temple to sacrifice in, and was this an issue during your conversion? Oh, great question there. It is. Okay. How Jews, how Jews atone for their sins uh, basically on, you know, on uh, Yom Kippur? The Jews have set aside a day of atonement in which they set, spend the entire day in synagogue. <coughs> it's preceded ten days earlier by Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And on the Jewish New Year, God writes in the names in the, the names in the Book of Life for those who will be for the coming year. And there's ten days if your name is not in the Book of Life uh, through through prayer and sacrifice, not not animal sacrifice. But you know, just the ordinary prayer, prayer and uh, alms. Would that be? Would that that alms. Would that be uh, their way of sacrifice? Yeah, prayer, alms, giving, uh, uh, doing good. Uh, through prayer and through good actions, uh, uh, um, Jews have the opportunity to recover and have their names in the Book of Life. And the very last chance is on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. And serious Jews spend the entire day in synagogue. They do not eat. It's a full fast. I mean, no food, no water, nothing. Nothing passes on the lips for 24 hours, from sundown to sundown. And they spend the day in the synagogue and praying and asking God's forgiveness. Was there a historic decisive moment when the, the old sacrifice stopped, I mean, other than the destruction of Jewish form? I mean, was there a specific moment or a decision, or was it just a, a situation in history? <coughs> okay. Uh, I don't think it was just a situation in history. It very seldom is. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, if we remember, uh, God prepared the Jews, the Jewish people, for 40 years in the desert to receive His law. Okay. Uh, when Jesus died and, uh, and celebrated the final sacrifice for us, God gave the Jewish people 40 years to accept it, uh, while they still had the sacrifices. At the end of those sacrifices. Catholic teaching is, and my understanding is, <coughs> that <coughs> God then allowed the temple to be destroyed. God did not destroy the temple, but God allowed, by His passive will, permissive will, God allowed the temple to be destroyed <coughs> because the Jews had not accepted Christ, and so <coughs> they would have to go out living their witness uh, without it. Christ was where He wanted them to go. All right, let's try and grab another call in here. Keith in Louisiana. What's your question for us tonight? Thank you, Marcus. Yes, I had a question for um, Marty. As a faithful Jewish observer and believing that the Lord the God is one and only one, how he may have had to reconcile the issue of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being one. Thank you, Keith. Great mm -hmm. question. Okay, yes it is. And I've, got, I've, I've picked it up in Second Exodus, one of the earliest parts. <coughs> the, <coughs> when we think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Remember, they are one in being with the Father. You know, Jesus is one in being with the Father. Um, all three, all three, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God, all the same spiritual substance. And therefore, <coughs> uh, it's not so much three gods, it's not all three gods, one God, the same one God we have always prayed to. Jews don't pray to one third of God. Jews pray to all of God, but not by name. The way I like to think of it is, think of a telescope. 
At first we look and we can see God, we can see the outline of God. Then we focus it more clearly and we see within the one God, three divine persons, distinct but not separate. And so that's how I came to understand it and I was comfortable with that. And we can see that that truly is revelation to the church in the sense that the scripture alone does not express the Trinity as clearly as we would like it to do. And that's why there's so many different struggles with Trinity, uh, Unitarianism. Well, right. well that, that's, that's true. Although I tell you, Marcus, I'd like to point out that when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, we had all three divine persons of the Blessed Trinity present at the same time. Now, even though the word Trinity itself isn't used, well, for one thing, they weren't speaking, you know, they weren't writing in English. <clears throat> but the presentation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in the same place and all at the same time, is as close as you're going to get. Yeah. Let's take uh, this email, trying to see if we can squeeze mm -hmm. this in here. It comes from uh, Andrew in Hempstead, New York. Dear gentlemen, a friend of mine is convinced that for her to be a good Christian, she must obey the commandment and worship on the Jewish Sabbath. She believes much of what the Catholic Church teaches, but because of the Sabbath question, she feels compelled to remain a Seventh-day Adventist. She is quick to point out that Jesus himself worshipped on the Sabbath. How do you deal with the Sabbath issue, and how may I help her to move beyond that? Thank you, Andrew. Okay, that's a good question, <clears throat> and I, I'm, pretty, I'm glad, glad it was raised. Okay, <clears throat> to begin with, <clears throat> the, the, what makes us Catholic, what makes us Catholic is, is a key issue here. <clears throat> what makes us Catholic is our belief <clears throat> in one thing, and that is, <clears throat> If Jesus Christ said to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And in doing that, he made Peter his vicar. A vicar on earth with authority to teach after he ascended to heaven to teach and write in his name. You know, it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> but Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter. Matthew 16, he says, you are Peter and upon this rock. But you know something? He keeps calling him Simon. You know, is <coughs> this is interesting. <coughs> he says, okay, Simon, I'm now changing your name to Peter, and he keeps calling him Simon. Why? Peter is the rock. Okay. While Jesus is on earth, while Jesus is still incarnate with us, he's the rock. You don't go to Peter to ask him questions, because Jesus asks him questions. But once Jesus ascends to the Father, then he left a vicar on earth uh, that we would have, and who would teach us infallibly on faith and morals. Faith being love of God, morals being love of one another. So, <clears throat> once we have established that Jesus, te that the Catholic Church teaches infallibly on faith and morals, once that can be accepted, <clears throat> then all of the doctrines are accepted because they come infallibly from the line of popes. And of course, each pope doesn't teach separately, but they, each pope teaches what all of the previous popes have taught, merely adapting it to new circumstances. For example, in the 19th century, you wouldn't have found anything on check hiding, you know, making, you know, making a check larger than, than it really is by yet you speaking in zeros because there weren't any checks then. So, okay, so a pope today might say, okay, check hiding is also against, contrary to the law, you know, the law against stealing. You know, you shall not steal. But basically, they're all teaching the same thing for 2,000 years. And so, once we have that, we can answer the question. Now, as to the specific point of the Seventh-day Adventist, uh, I'm sorry, as to the specific point of why we worship on Sunday, because Jesus celebrated the first Mass for us on Sunday, and <clears throat> that was followed. Jesus celebrated another Mass after that, and from then on it was always on Sunday. And Sunday is the Lord's Day. Sunday is not the Sabbath, but Sunday fulfills the Sabbath. And, and we trust the teachings of the, I want to define this because I know some of them are to understand our understanding of the infallibility of, of a Pope. Sure. It's not that because they became Pope, they all of a sudden became mm -hmm. sinless and infallible. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that, that the, the revelation and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is what's infallible as it guides the Holy Father. Of course. One of those important yeah. issues to right. protect, to hold true to what was taught, and to protect him from saying something that is outside of that deposit of faith. Correct. And you know that we've had 264 popes. Not a single one has ever reversed the predecessor on faith and morals. That's definitely a guy in the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, go with one last email. 
uh, to be a long email will be a quick question, a quick okay. answer to it. Patrick, Pat, excuse me, Patrick in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. My girlfriend and I will be getting engaged soon, and we love each other very much. We both agree that we should attend church together as a family. The problem is that we don't agree on which, which church that should be. Given that I was raised in the Catholic Church and she was raised in the Church of Christ, you can understand her disagreement. She thinks that we should compromise. I see there to be no compromise on this situation. She tells me that there are too many things that she disagrees with, such as Eucharist, purgatory, the Pope, etc., etc. What is your advice on making her see what I see? When I got to answer that in the short, in the, in the <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the answer has to be <clears throat> that the Catholic Church remains the only church that even claims to speak infallibly on faith and morals. The Catholic Church is the only church that has the complete deposit of faith that Jesus Christ has given to us. All right, that's good. We certainly can go into more than that, but we recommend them to read uh, your second Exodus, which will deal with this issue in a number of ways. I'm Amen. Sure. Yes, it will. About in closing, talk to us about uh, what Jesus means to you. What Jesus means to me. <clears throat> Jesus summarizes to me the entire Old Testament coming to completion. You know, when, when Jesus spoke to his apostles, the risen Christ spoke to his apostles, the first words he said were, Shalom Aleichem, which is normally translated, peace be with you. But what's important to understand is the Jewish idea of peace. <clears throat> includes completion. A Jew is not comfortable until the task is completed, the race won, uh, the thing accomplished. And so now we can rest. You know, it's done, it's finished. And so what Jesus was really saying to his apostles is, my completion, I give you. Jesus completed and transformed all of the lessons that his Father in heaven was teaching us and continues to teach us. So it all comes together. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of a couple of those statements from uh, in the Mass that we say every week. One of my most famous, favorite things is the prayer we say towards the end. You know, Lord, I am unworthy to receive you, but only say the word that I, you know, and I mm -hmm. uh, may hold. That, that statement from the uh, uh, the centurion in the Gospel. I guess is that your journey from Judaism to Catholic Church involved a lot of surrender, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of humble. Uh, humble pie. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I wanted a custom as a Jew, uh, and, and this is not, a, I'm not speaking for Judaism, but for Marty Barrett. I wasn't accustomed during my Jew, the days of my Jewish life to being humble. Uh, I was accustomed, rather, to being a strong person and to, frankly, deciding things for myself, calling the shots as I saw them. Uh, I had to become humble and surrender myself to God recognizing that the original sin and all of the sins that have come after have arisen out of the proposition that never mind what God says, I'm going to try to do it my way. And so I had to surrender that and say, okay, there are things I don't understand, but if Jesus says so, it's true. St. Peter, St. Peter gave the perfect Jewish answer to this. And Peter was a Jew. And he said, okay. St. Peter was a Jew. And what did he say at Capernaum? Lord, you have the words of eternal life. I don't know what you're talking about, but if you say so, it's true. <laughs> Where else can we go? You know, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Marty, thank you very much. Oh, God bless you, Mark. Thank you for joining us, and we, we pray the best for your book, Second Exodus. Mm -hmm. Again, I want to mention that. And if you're interested in finding out more about uh, Marty's journey of faith and also about the books he's written, go to secondexodus.com. That's right. It should be on your mm -hmm. on the screen so the audience can see it at home. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marty. I'm, I'm always glad when we have a Jewish convert on the, or a, a completed Jew, that's the right way to say it, because it reminds us of the continuity to the old and the new. In the Old Testament, it wasn't just you and God. It was you as a part of the people of God in relationship to God. And that continuity never shifted. In Christ, we become an adapt, adopted part of the people of God called the church. And through the revelation given to the church and the inspiration, we then know how to obey and worship God faithfully. That's the journey that we walk on together in our journey home. Thank you for joining us each week. I look forward to being with you again next week. God bless you.